I generally try and be a good person, so, but I don't believe in the Christian God. Um, do you think I'm going to hell? The video that you're about to watch is about hell. It's a girl from a Q&A and a Frank Turk video from, I think, like 12 years ago. But it's such an important conversation because you can really pay attention to her frustration with God in light of her understanding of hell. Let's dive in. What do you mean by being a good person? I try to treat other people decently and... Um, okay. What do you mean by decent? According to the standards of our society. In a way that, you know, hopefully they'll react well to me and they'll treat me well. Okay. But, you know, society sometimes have standards that aren't good, like we've mentioned. That's true. Society. Okay. So, um, is the purpose of life to be good? I have no idea what the purpose of life is. Well then, how can I answer the question? Well, my question is, do you think I'm going to hell? It's not what I have to... Well, I, I don't think God is going to force anybody into heaven against their will. <laughs> what if I wanted to go to heaven? Well, then you pursue God. It doesn't appear like you're interested in doing that. Well, there's no way to prove... Uh, I don't believe there's a way that we can prove God in this life. Whatever, if there's another... Well, let me ask you a question, Anne. If I were to give you a book, would you read it? Possibly. It's yes or no. <laughs> it depends. Reading... I've, got a, I've got a lot of books. Well, you don't, you don't have to read it now, but would you read it over the summer? Maybe. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask you this. I mean, if God exists, you seem to be ap kind of apathetic about it. Yeah. Well, why would God force you force you into his presence for all eternity? Well, that's not my question. My question is about hell. That, that is the difference between heaven and hell. hell. Heaven is with God. Hell is separation from God. I mean, if that's your definition of hell. Well, that's basically what hell is. I mean, there's a lot of descriptors in the Bible about it. But at the end of the day, hell is separation from God. I mean, do you think I'm going to burn for all eternity? Well, it depends on what you mean by burn, because... <laughs> There's a lot of different metaphors in the Bible. Some, on one hand you've got burning, on the other hand you've got outer darkness. So you can't have burning and outer darkness together. They're metaphors meant to communicate destruction. Meant to communicate being apart from God. Was Jesus' resurrection a metaphor? No, I don't think so, because otherwise a lot of people died for a metaphor. So how do you distinguish between a metaphor and what's not a metaphor in the Bible? Good question. Oh, the same way we do in normal language. Like when we say, you know, this computer cost me an arm and a leg. You know what that means, right? Unless you know, somebody I, took an arm and a leg from you. Yeah, I, if, if, I was an yeah if I was an amputee, but we don't... <laughs> we generally understand most times when metaphors are used and when something is literal. So, um, I, 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 I don't think hell would be a nice place to go to, but even Christopher Hitchens says hell, or, or back up, Christopher Hitchens says heaven would be hell to him. He doesn't want God now, hmm. so he's not going to want God in eternity. No, I'm not Christopher Hitchens. I know. But I'm just simply saying that if God exists, and if Christianity is true, would you become a Christian? And you kind of said no. Well, it depends if it's in this life or it's in a theoretically another life. Because I don't believe that you can prove anything about whether Christianity or whether there's life after death in this lifetime. So there's no, I mean... Why know. do you say that? Why, why do you, and what do you mean by proof? Um, beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, good. I think that's true. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, why, why, why couldn't we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus rose from the dead? Because nobody... But all the testimonies about it were written hundreds of years later. There's a lot of, I mean, I was just testimony from a long time ago. That doesn't hold much weight in, I mean. It doesn't matter how far back the testimony was. If it's eyewitness testimony and you can reconstruct the original, it could have happened yesterday. Well, what about Herodotus? What does that have to do with Jesus? Does everything that he, I mean, you know, he wrote histories, you know, back even before. Um, I, 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 hang on, hang on one second. You seem to be saying that... You can't prove Jesus rose from the dead. At the same time, you're saying you can prove he didn't. I don't think she's saying that. No. Well, yeah, it, seems, it seems highly unlikely because given that you, nobody else in the history of human existence has ever risen from the dead. It seems very unlikely that one person in one specific situation would have given that the only thing we have to prove it is that eyewitness testimony. That's not true. Okay, well, let's talk about that. 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 Let
is such an amazing miracle. Because if resurrections happened all the time, we wouldn't look at Christ's resurrection as being anything unusual. What but about all the other miracles that were, you know, maybe some of them are true, maybe some of them aren't. You know? That's right. You have to evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis. And let me just say, you're factually in error about when the documents were written down. Okay, Even, well, when were they written down? Well, as, you, as you'll see tomorrow night, they were... I'm not going to see you tomorrow night. <laughs> okay, well, I can't go through the whole presentation of tomorrow night tonight. I'm sorry. Can you briefly summarize? Yeah, I'll say that all, most, if not all, the documents were written down prior to 70 AD. And okay. much of the data that was written down goes all the way back to the event itself, especially the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, which even liberal scholars agree is pre-40 AD. So... This is very early testimony. Even Bart Ehrman, the great skeptic, says Jesus certainly existed, certainly uh, was crucified, certainly his disciples believed he rose from the dead. The only thing Bart Ehrman can't bring himself to uh, 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 believe is that he actually did rise from the dead because he says an historian can't know that. Why? Because philosophically he's ruled miracles out of existence, not because the data isn't there. Right, but how do you distinguish that from um, other miracles that have, you know, people say that, you know, they've proved beyond a certainty that they interviewed all sorts of people and they definitely said that this miracle uh, happened on such and such a date. You know, all the different, you know, martyrs in uh, Catholicism. I mean, do you, you have to look at you, you have to look at each each alleged miracle claim on a case by case basis and make a judgment as to whether or not the eyewitness and other testimony is is good enough to meet the standard you brought up, which is the right standard beyond a reasonable doubt. So what other miracles happened in humanity? Well, I think the miracles surrounding Jesus certainly happened. What because, well, uh, the greatest miracle of all has already occurred. Right, so are there What's any others? The greatest miracle of all is already, I don't know, you have to, you have to think right, about... Right, so, I mean, have you applied the case-by-case -case basis to other miracles? And what have you come up with? Well, you'd have to give me a miracle. I just can't comment on every single well, miracle. And that's kind of beyond yeah. the scope of what we're doing here today. Okay? So, you have to look at each one on a case-by-case -case basis. If the greatest miracle of all is already occurred, and I haven't even told you what that is, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, the resurrection is easy. The, creation, the, the greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We've just given evidence that the first verse is true. If that verse is true, are the other verses in the book at least possible? Sure. Okay. So you can't philosophically rule miracles out as David Hume does, as Bart Herman does, as James Tabor from UNC. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Because the greatest miracles already occur. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... If that's God depending, exists, that's miracles are possible. That's depending on your de definition of a miracle. Well, I mean, it does. Yeah, it does so. depend. I'm talking about an intervention of God into the space-time continuum. Okay. Let's you and me talk some more. I'll give you a book if you read it. If you won't read it, then I won't give one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll read it. Okay, good. Oh, but quick question. Um, do you think that I'm going to hell? <laughs> I think I'm going to hell if I don't bow my knee to a creator because I'm a sinner. Right. And if you don't bow your knee to a creator to get the free gift of eternal salvation, God will not force you into his presence against your will. He loves you too much for that. Hmm. So I think that's a yes. I love his answer at the end. It reminds me of what C.S. Lewis said, which I'm going to read right now. He said this, There are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is opened. And I think that that, and Lewis also talks about the idea that the gates of hell are closed from the inside. And I think that this understanding is so important, is that like Frank Turk was saying at the beginning of this clip, that hell is essentially separation from God. That is most essentially what it is. Christians have long debated how exactly that plays itself out. Is it literal, eternal, conscious torment? Is it conditional immortality where the soul is annihilated in the absence of God, God being the source of all goodness and uh, the essence of all life? Christians have debated this for a long time. However, essentially the point is that you 
are not with God, and because God is the source of all good things, you are isolated in some fashion or another from him. And, and so it is literally a question of, do you want to be with God or not? Like, like Frank Turk said, God will not force anybody into his presence. He will not sort of psychically rape a, a individual to bend their will to, to, towards himself or else you literally cannot have love. You can only have love when, when a, a proposal or a proposition is made from one to another and the other is able to respond either, I do, I, I, we can say I do to God, or we can say I do not. And when we do not accept the proposal, the, the, the literal wedding proposal that God has made to humanity on the cross, when we say I do not, hell is the, ne- the logically necessary outcome of that removal of oneself from the presence of God. And that's the, it's the eternalization of that rebellion against the creator who has come and has died and has paid the ultimate price for us. When we are so prideful that we are not willing to accept the most heroic act and the most generous gift, we will not be forced into the presence of God. And with, I believe, great tears in his eyes, he says, like Lewis said here, thy will be done. That being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, heavier topic than usual, but extremely important. Don't be the person to whom God must say, thy will be done. Choose Jesus, choose life.